First, through deflation, you're not distorting the allocation of capital by either one. You're just saying we want stable money. That's kind of the Fed's job. Then the question is, why is it 2%? And you know, I disagree with Milton Friedman on a lot of things, but Milton Friedman said zero. He didn't think it should be 2%. He thought zero was the right number. I agree with that. So why is it 2%? Well, the Fed has a rationale. Um, the rationale is every now and then you have to cut interest rates to stimulate the economy, bail out the stock market. You just need a rate cut. And the evidence is pretty good that negative rates don't work. They have been tried for years in Japan, Switzerland, uh, I believe Sweden for a while, um, and, and the ECB, uh, but they don't do anything. They don't uh, stimulate. In fact, they often do the opposite of what they're intended to do. Let me give you a, a concrete example. So the idea is if I cut interest rates you know, lower and lower, as a saver or an investor, I'm going to say, well, I don't like those low yields. I'm, you know, I put money in the bank. I only get you know, a quarter of 1% or half of 1% or whatever. So I'll go buy some treasury notes or I'll go buy some stocks. And that's called the portfolio channel effect. In other words, by keeping rates so low, you make simple savings and liquid investments unattractive and you drive investors to other investments, housing, stocks, bonds, whatever, commodities perhaps. And then that creates a wealth effect. And if my assets go up, I feel more prosperous. And maybe I spend more money and that helps the economy, et cetera, et cetera. That's the theory. It's all garbage, by the way. But there's, there's very little evidence for the wealth effect. I mean, yeah, assets go up, people feel a little better about it. But the idea that they turn around and spend more money does not hold up. Uh, the people with the most assets tend to have the most discretionary income and you know once you got a couple of cars and a couple of houses you know and a, a decent wardrobe you're actually going to go spend more money well probably not you'll probably save it or invest it I'm not saying those are bad things but the idea that it stimulates the economy is, is not true but if you follow the theory and say okay lower rates force you into to asset purchases etc wouldn't negative rates do even more of that because what's what happens with a negative rate you have a hundred thousand dollars in the bank and at a negative one percent interest rate i take on the on the government or the treasury or the bank i'm taking a thousand dollars a year i'm taking one percent out of your account so you're sitting there you just say hey, i just want to save a hundred thousand dollars that's all i want but with a negative rate it goes 99 98 97 and the idea there is well now you're really going to spend your money because it's kind of use it or lose it again these are the kind of theories but let me kind of ground that in the real world a little bit what do people actually think when they see negative rates these people say to themselves huh there must be deflation coming you know the economy must be in really bad shape deflation must be getting the upper hand why else would they go to negative rates if they weren't worried about deflation and if they are worried about deflation and they are then i'm going to say more we're far from getting people to spend uh remember the dollar is worth more in a deflationary world your dollars are actually worth more. In real terms, a dollar can be, you're just a bank account, can be your best performing investment in a deflationary world. If, if you have 2% deflation, then the real value of a, of a savings account with zero interest goes up 2%. And that's probably better than what stocks are doing in that world. So people act rationally. They say, okay, we have negative rates. Central bank must be worried about deflation. If they're worried, I'm worried. And I'm gonna say more because first of all, those savings will do well in deflation. Uh, you know, I need, I need to be prepared for that. Last thing I want to do is spend. If prices are going down, why would I spend? I'll wait six months, get a cheaper price. So in other words, real world behavior is the exact opposite of what central bankers predict. Central bankers predict, use it or lose it, you'll go spend the money because I'm going to take it away. But real people say, no, I'm going to say more because you're signaling to me that the value of the money is going up because you're worried about deflation and prices are coming down. So what's the rush? So for all those reasons, negative rates don't work. Now, in theory, cutting rates from five to four to three to two down to zero does perhaps have some stimulative effect, not as much as people think. Uh, and so the Fed says, well, we don't want to start with zero. If we start with zero, if that's our target and negative doesn't work and the economy goes into a recession, how do we stimulate the economy? We can't go below zero, but we can't cut rates because we're at zero. So they believe that they ought to keep rates around 2%. That was inflation is about 2%. Interest rates are about 2%. And that gives you two points of cuts. You could do in 25 basis point rate cuts, you could do eight cuts. 
you know, it's a full year of rate cuts from you know, two to one and three quarters, one and a half, one and a quarter, et cetera. You can do eight 25 basis point rate cuts with 2%. So the Fed says our target rate is 2% because we need a little cushion in case we have to cut. And if we're at zero, we don't have a cushion we can't cut. That's what they say. The reality is the following. Uh, and the way I explain this, it's like a little kid, like a nine-year-old kid, his, his mother leaves her purse around and the kid goes in the purse and sees there's $50 in the purse. And he says, well, even an eight-year-old say, well, if I steal the $50, mom's going to catch me and I'm going to be in trouble. But if I take a couple bucks, she won't notice. Like she's not counting the dollars every day. And the Fed's idea is if I steal 2% from you, you won't notice. 10%, yeah, you'll be up in arms. You'll be driving tractors up the steps of the Fed the way they did in 1980. But 2%, you kind of won't notice. Well, what's the math of 2%? Well, 2% cuts the value of the dollar in half in 35 years. It cuts it in half again in another 35 years. Bear in mind, you're starting from down half. So in a typical lifetime of 70 years, at 2%, the dollar is going to lose 75% of its purchasing power. So in 70 years, typical lifetime, your dollar loses 75% of its purchasing power at 2%. And that's really the point because 2% year in, year out, probably not enough to feel, but it's insidious. And by doing it for a long enough period of time, you destroy the purchasing power of the dollar. And that's what they really want to do. Why? Because the federal debt is nominal. The debt is nominal. If I owe you a dollar, I owe you a dollar. Whether in real terms, it's a dollar five or 95 cents, that's separate, but I owe you the buck. Well, if you can destroy the purchasing power of the dollar, you're actually reducing the real value of the debt. People say America has never defaulted on its debt. Well, first of all, that's not true. It's not a true statement. But the easiest, quietest, stealthiest way to default is inflation. It's like, hey, here's your billion dollars back. You know, good luck buying a loaf of bread because I've destroyed the value of the dollar. Now, 3% will do it in about 23 years, which means that you'll destroy 75% of the purchasing power in 46 years, not 70 years. So on 4%, 5%, et cetera. At 10%, you cut the value of the dollar in half in seven years. People like to bang the table and say, you know, since, since the creation of the Fed in 1913, the dollar has lost 95% of its purchasing power. Well, that's a true statement, but you don't need 110 years. We lost 50% in five years between 1977 and 1982. So inflation is insidious. It is a tax. It is a form of theft. But like the kid with the mother's wallet, if you keep the theft you know, in small little bites, but do it long enough, you can get the whole thing and no one will notice. So they say we want 2% because we want to be able to cut if we have to. But the real reason is we want to basically erode the value of the debt and erode the purchasing power of the dollar in ways that you don't notice. And, and they can be very patient. That's how they do it. I can tell you exactly what the Fed's going to do, and you can do this at home. So if listeners want to take notes, it's, it's really easy. First of all, what is the problem the Fed's trying to solve? What is their solution? And then what are the exceptions to that so that we can have a complete predictive analytic model? The problem they're trying to solve is the following. We know from a long series of experiences, you know, 30 or more business cycles since the end of World War II, that when the U.S. is in a recession, you have to cut interest rates three to four percent to get the U.S. out of a recession. You need three to four hundred basis points of cuts to get the U.S. It's like a plane heading for the ground. How do you pull it out of a nosedive and get it back up in the sky? The answer is 300 basis points of cuts. How do you cut interest rates 300 basis points when you're only at 75 basis points? The answer is you can't. And forget about negative rates. The evidence is now pretty good that negative rates do not work. In other words, negative rates are not more of the same. When you go from, let's say, a half of 1%, then you go to a quarter, and then you go to zero, and then you keep going to negative 25, you didn't just ease by another 25 basis points. The evidence from Japan and Europe is that you're through the looking glass and you have very strange effects, really unintended consequences. And I'll give you a couple examples. So the conventional theory is, well, the more I cut interest rates, the more stimulus I get. That's a joke, but that's what they think. But if I go negative, you're absolutely going to go out and spend the money. Because if you don't spend the money, I'm going to take it away. You sit there long enough, you'll have nothing left in your bank account. Because I'm going to take, with these negative interest rates, I'm going to take it away. So people will run out and spend. And the other thing is that, you know, it's, it's obviously, you know, from the lending point of view, they'll borrow money, you know, because the bank pays you to be a borrower. But here's what happens in the real world. And this is the difference between academics and human beings. When people see negative interest rates, people have goals in mind. They have lifetime goals, right? They want a kid's education, parents' health care, their own health care, retirement. 
If you start taking their money away with negative rates, guess what they do? They save more. They're like, hey, I got to put my kids through college. You're taking my money away. I better save more. And then what kind of signal is the central bank sending with negative interest rates? They're sending a deflationary signal. So people go, well, if, you're, if you think it's going to be deflation, I'm not going to spend money. I'll wait till the price comes down. So you're trying to encourage lending and spending. And what you get is more savings and no spending, deferred spending. You get the exact opposite of what you want. So again, another uh, egghead experiment gone awry. But the point being, so negative rates don't work. So zero bound really is zero. It really is a boundary. And you know, Bernanke has said this in his recent writings, and, and I think he's right about that. So back to the problem, how do you cut interest rates to 300 basis points when you're at 75? Well, the answer is you can't, so you have to raise them to 300 basis points. So the problem the Fed is trying to solve is how do they get rates to three and a quarter percent before the next recession? Now, I'm not saying the Fed sees a recession, and that's easy because the Fed never sees a recession. In 102 years, the Fed has never seen a recession, never forecast a recession, but they know their economic history. We are eight years into an expansion. This is, it, it feels punk. I mean, the growth is anemic, but you know, labor force participation is low, productivity is dropping, there are a lot of bad things going on. But in fact, we are in the eighth year, actually coming up on, soon be entering the ninth year of an expansion, which began in June, 2009. Right, by the way, you have a hard time convincing most Americans that we're not still in a recession. Depressions are different than recessions. You know, the technical definition of a recession is Two consecutive quarters of declining GDP with rising unemployment, a couple other bells and whistles, little subjective factors, but that's basically it. So people, when you say depression, they're like, huh, depression sounds worse than a recession. And if recession is two quarters of declining GDP, then a depression must be like 10 quarters of declining GDP because it's got to be worse. But that's not the definition. The definition of a depression, you can have growth in a depression, but it's below trend growth. In other words, if trend is three, three and a half, and you're actually banging out one and a half two, that gap between let's say one and a half and three and a half percent growth, that's depressed growth. It's an output gap. It compounds over time and you never get it back. We are losing trillions of dollars of wealth. We are impoverishing future generations on a relative basis because of our inability to get back to trend growth. So the reason American people feel this and don't listen to the economists and they're right is because we're in a depression. So leaving that aside, the Fed at least understands the business cycle and the fact that the next recession, you know, they say they don't die of old age, but they do die and we're getting close to the next one. So they are in a desperate race to get rates up to three and a half percent before the next recession hits so they can cut them to get out of the recession. The question is, can you raise rates enough to cure the next recession without causing the recession you're preparing to cure? That's the dilemma. That's the finesse. My answer is no, they're not going to be able to do it, but they think they can. Why are they in this box? Well, because Bernanke should have raised rates in 2010, 2011, in the early stages of the expansion, when the economy would have been much better able to bear it than it is now. Bernanke skipped a whole cycle. He skipped a whole rate increase cycle to pursue these wacky experiments and, you know, QE and zero interest rate policy and all that. I spoke to Bernanke about this and he used the word experiment. He said this was an experiment. He you know, Bernanke made his academic reputation by studying the Great Depression, you know, in the wake of Friedman and Anna Schwartz and some others. But he, he was a great scholar of the Great Depression, and he got his chance to kind of try out his theories. But what he told me was, he said, 30 years from now, some new Ben Bernanke, some young scholar will look back and tell us if we did a good job or not. We actually don't know right now. See, the, the Great Depression was, was really too technical recessions, 29 to 33, and then 1937, 38. But from 33 to 37, we had an expansion, but the whole thing was a depression because we never got out of it. You know, the stock market recovered the 1929 high in 1954. It was a long time to get back to even. But Bernanke's mantra was, doing something is better than doing nothing. I completely disagree. It's better to do nothing if you don't know what you're doing. And this is really the monetary equivalent of the Hippocratic Oath. You know, doctors say, you know, first rule of being a doctor is first do no harm. Anyway, bottom line is by pursuing QE and zero interest rate policy, Bernanke failed to raise rates during the early stages of a cyclical expansion, which he should have done. If he had, if he had, the economy would have been just fine and we'd be able to cut them today. But he didn't. So Janet Yellen now has to make up for lost time. So that's the mission. But again, 
And this is what the market completely does not get. And the Wall Street economists don't get, nobody gets this because they see the Fed raising rates and they've done the correlations and the regressions back to World War II and they go, huh, every time the Fed raises rates, the economy is getting stronger. So if the Fed's raising rates, the economy must be getting stronger. So bid up stock prices, et cetera. But that's like saying umbrellas cause rain. That was they've got the causality backwards. The Fed never leaves the economy, ever. The Fed follows the economy. So a normal business cycle looks like this. So you get a little expansion going and unemployment starts to go down and industrial capacity utilization starts to go up and inflation starts to go up. And the Fed's watching, 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 and then it keeps going. And they go, oh, it's getting a little hot. We better raise rates. And they raise rates. But of course, they started too late. The expansion keeps going. Inflation keeps going up. Unemployment keeps going down. Then the economy starts to cool down. Unemployment goes up and then prices go down and capacity utilization drops. And we get into a recession like, huh, we better cut. You know, and then they cut and cut and cut and cut. And then you hit the bottom and then you come out of it again. So think of that as like a nice, pretty sine wave, right? That's a business expansion, business contraction over and over. 30 or so times since the end of World War II, with the Fed always following the economy, never leading the economy. So all the big brands on Wall Street, they've got all this data and they say, well, every time the Fed raises rates, the economy is getting stronger. That has absolutely been true for like 30 times since the end of World War II. It is not true today. The reason it's not true today is because Bernanke skipped the cycle and they're playing catch up. For the first time since 1937, the Fed is tightening into weakness. As a key thing to bear in mind, the Fed is tightening into weakness. They are not leading the economy to strength. They are not responding to strength, even though Wall Street thinks they are. And there's a great danger that they're actually going to cause the recession they're preparing to cure, as I mentioned. The Fed will raise rates 25 basis points four times a year from now until the middle of 2019 until they get them to three and a quarter percent. So like clockwork, every March, June, September, December, for 2017, 2018, into 2019, look for a Fed rate hike until they get to three and a quarter percent, at which point they'll be able to say, all right, now we're three and a quarter. If we have a recession tomorrow, we can cut them back down to zero again and get out of it. That'll be mission accomplished. Now, this is why I was sitting there in December, like, yep, they're going to raise them in March. And right now I'll tell your listeners they're going to raise them in June. There's your Fed response function. There's your baseline scenario. What are the exceptions to Fed rate hike. Under what conditions will they not raise rates? Because this, everything I just described to you, they've had in mind since March 2015 when Yellen took patience out of the statement. That was the end of forward guidance. And by the way, if you go back to 2015, you know, I said they're not going to raise rates all year and they weren't going to do the lift off that, that people were looking for to March, June, September. And they didn't lift off in September because the Chinese rate exchange devaluation, the stock market fell out of bed August 2015. Finally, they raised them in December 2015, and Wall Street was ready for March. I said, no, in June, no, September, no. It wasn't until December 2016 that they raised them the second time. So obviously, there are conditions under which they don't raise rates, notwithstanding the baseline scenario. So what are those conditions? There are three. Well, four, actually. So if you see job creation below 75,000, that will cause them to pause. By the way, pause is the key word. If you go home through the speeches, you'll see the word pause. In Dudley's recent remarks, pauses the Fed's jargon for we're not going to raise rates. We got the gym scenario, which I took from the Fed as their scenario, or a technical recession. So, you know, we're going to know Friday what the first quarter GDP is. It's pretty close to negative, but I'm not saying we're in a recession now. We might be. But if you see a recession, they'll pause. See job creation below 75,000, they'll pause. By the way, that's a very low bar. You know, if you see a jobs report, see, this is the other thing that confuses Wall Street. You see a jobs report with 100,000 jobs. So Wall Street goes, oh, that report's really weak. The Fed's going to think twice. No, 75,000 is the number. Yellen told us that. It was in one of her speeches. You just have to be a geek like me and, and read all the speeches. So the third factor would be disinflation. So the Fed has this 2% inflation target. They missed it for six years. They're finally getting close to hitting it. By the way, I think the listeners know they use the uh, PCE core deflator year over year. There's PPI and CPI and core, non, a bunch of inflation indices, but we know what they use. PCE, core deflator year over year. That actually has been getting close to 2%. But if you see it turn around, if you see that gap down to like 1.5, 1 1.4, 1 1.3, then they will pause. 
The last condition for the pause is a disorderly decline in stock markets, more than 5%. If you see a 6 7 8% decline, so if the S&P went down 100 points, Fed doesn't care. Dow Jones goes down 1,000 points, Fed doesn't care. But beyond that, if you see the S&P start to go down 150 or the Dow start to go down 1,500 points in a disorderly way, it looks a little scary. It looks like there's no bottom. It looks like if you see that, they'll pause. So the Fed is going to raise like clockwork four times a year for the next two and a half years, unless you see job creation below 75,000, disinflation, a technical recession. If you don't see one of those things, they're going to raise rates. And so right now, I don't see any of them. I mean, they could all happen, but it looks like, you know, growth is going to be positive. Job creation has been decent, you know, over 100,000. Disinflation is probably coming, but not quite here yet. And they'll want to see a couple months in a row. And the stock market's not crashing. So none of the pause conditions are in place. Therefore, they will raise rates. Simple. Just to kind of cut to the chase, the banking crisis is not over. The crises don't happen all at once in one day. They emerge, regulators deal with them, the other new investors come in, they go, it's all good, we got this under control, and then there's a quiet period, and then they just pop back up again. It's because they were never fixed in the first place. Let me explain why the banking crisis is not over. And for here, we're going to use a little financial history, which is underrated, but in my view, extremely valuable. Maybe just because I've been around long enough. I'm kind of a, a magnet for trouble when it comes to this. My first banking crisis was the Herstadt Bank in Germany in 1974. You have to have been around a while to remember that one. That was a foreign exchange. That was a bank where, in those days, if you were in Germany and the U.S. and you were doing foreign exchange trading uh, and you sold, it was Deutsche Marks because it was before the Euro, if you sold for dollars, you would, or bought them rather, they would deliver the Deutsche Marks to you in German time and then you would pay the dollars in New York time. They failed in between. They got all the Deutsche Marks but they never paid the dollars because they failed in the middle of the day. And uh, that started a crisis. But anyway, it's a long list. But let me, let me point to uh, two in particular. So the first one, one I had some front row seat, 1997, 1998, the Asia-Russia LTC and financial crisis. Now what people don't realize, people remember you know, September, 1998, you know, LTCMs go under, about to go under 1.3, trillion dollars in derivatives that's back when a trillion was real money the fed had no interest in bailing out a hedge fund i was there i was their lawyer uh, we didn't expect to bail out we're like why would the fed bail out us why would the fed do that well the answer was it wasn't about us it was about the 19 banks that were going to fail if we fail because they're dealers so if they sell us you know 1.3 trillion dollars of derivatives which they did they buy them from the other side and they're, they're relying on the fact that they have a two-sided position and they make a spread. That's what they do. If one side of the trade goes away, all of a sudden they're net sure, they're naked on the other side and they got to go out and sell stocks, like 15, $15 billion worth of stocks to cover the fact that they were long that much on, this, on their side of the swap. Well, I can tell you what $15 billion of uh, fire sales stocks will do the stock market. They would have closed the New York Stock Exchange and a lot else beside. So technically they were bailing us out. We got $4 billion in cash, I'll put the fire out, but they were really bailing out Wall Street. We lost the money, Wall Street put in the 4 billion, but then Wall Street owned it and they got all their money back a year later, but, but they, they put out the fire. But here's my point. That didn't start in September 1998. That started in June 1997 in Thailand. Thailand had a run on the bank. Dollars were leaving the country. They had pegged the Thai bot to the dollar uh, and people panicked. They said, because money had been going in for resorts and casinos and what else. And everybody wanted their money back, taking the dollars out. The Central Bank of Thailand could not maintain the peg. They imposed capital controls said no more dollars and we're going to devalue the bot, uh, which meant for a U.S. investor, all that was, all your money was worth a lot less. That then spread to pretty quickly spread through Asia and then it went to Korea. But here, here's the point. It entered a quiet period in December, January, February, things calmed down and everyone said, it's okay. And by the long-term capital was fine. We, at the time we were, we were like looking into Asia for investment opportunities, but then it came back in April in a small way because Sandy Wild was selling he was merging city and, and travel. And he told the Solomon guys, I don't want any volatility in earnings because I don't want to mess up this deal. So you guys have to reduce your books. But the process of Solomon getting out of swaps, widen the spreads, we're sitting there long-term like, hey, spreads are blowing out, buy more. And then of course it came to a head in August, Russia 
defaulted on their internal debt, their external debt, and divided the ruple. It was like a trifecta. And then that caused the panic, and then it got worse, and then finally the bailout at the end of September. But my point is, that took a year and almost a year and a half. It was a long, quiet period in the middle. So just when you, when you see a crisis evolving, and then there's a quiet period, don't assume it's over. It just means that things have been patched up, but it's still percolating below the surface. The second one, of course, the 2007, 2008, 2009 global financial crisis. Now, what happened there? Everyone remembers September 15, 2008, midnight on a Sunday, Lehman Brothers files for bankruptcy, okay? That started in the spring of 07. HSBC reported lower than expected earnings because mortgage losses on subprime mortgages were higher than expected. And that's when Bernanke actually is on the record in the March uh, minutes of the FOMC said, this will blow over. Yeah, and then it kind of came to a head in August 07. That's when Jim Cramer and Aaron Burnett on CNBC goes, they know nothing, they know nothing. And Cramer was right. They actually didn't know anything. But the Fed like cut the discount rate and they, and they cut the Fed funds rate. And then September, you remember all the September 7, Hank Paulson's treasury secretary, he announced the super sieve, you know, special investment vehicle that was going to buy all the credit card receivables from all the banks with government money and then put them into a fund and work them out and all this stuff, which never happened by the way, it was a dumb idea, but it never happened. But then in December, 2007 into January, 2008, what happened? The sovereign wealth funds bailed out the US banking system. Abu Dhabi, and they, they were capped at 10%, but Abu Dhabi bought 10% of City, Temasek in Singapore bought, I think 10% of Morgan Stanley, Kuwait Investment Fund. One by one, those sovereign wealth funds bailed out the US banking system. So January, all good. February, it's all good. What happens in March? Bear Stearns blows up because it wasn't all good. That was the point. By the way, if you ever see a CEO saying it's all good, get your money out then. It's not that they're lying. It's just that they don't realize how quickly things can change. So then, okay, so March, Bear Stearns blows up. What's hap what happens in June? Fannie Mae. What happens in July? Freddie Mac. What happened in August? The Congress passed legislation bailing out Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac. So once again, this is your second quiet period. It's all good. You know, the Congress saved the day. Even though Bear Stearns, Fannie and Freddie had just blown up, the Congress in theory bailed them out and it was all good. And that lasted about a month and then September, here comes Lehman. So, so my point is financial crisis can have one or more quiet periods. In fact, they usually do. Everyone remembers that when the, the you know the Krakatoa erupted, but they don't know when the when the shaking began. They forget that these things usually have a year or longer. So if that's the case, and it is the case, I mean those are just the facts. What should we say about the 2023 banking crisis? Well, we had this again: March 9th, March 10th, March 12th, March 19th, May 1st. This sequence of failures, big ones, including Credit Suisse, were in the quiet phase. Everyone thinks it's all good. So let's put a finer point on that, and I'll go through this quickly. Downward sloping yield curves. Now that you know, yield curve is just the x-axis are the maturities, the y-axis is the interest rates. Yield curves are supposed to be upward sloping. So the longer the maturity, the more interest you're supposed to get. If I'm lending to you for one month, I want a certain rate. If I'm lending to you for 10 years, I want a higher rate because I'm taking more risk, more bad things can happen. Well, the yield curves are actually going down. What does that mean? It means that the big money, the wholesale money, expects a recession, maybe a financial crisis, and they think interest rates are going to drop like a rock. So why would I take less on my 10-year note than on my one-month treasury bill? Well, the answer is, I think I think that 4% on the 10-year treasury note is going to look pretty sweet when rates hit 2%. So that's what the market is betting. So it goes back to collateral shortage, bill shortage, dollar shortage, shrinking balance sheets, liquidity. There's a whole global liquidity financial crisis coming at the same time there's this whole recession coming in 2020 they were back to where they started in 2013 except worse because the balance sheet was even bigger it's not going to take seven years this time it might be more like seven months and the reason is twofold number one we're more leveraged and the stock market is more bubbly and so the whole thing's more vulnerable number two the market has seen this movie before like hey we watched this play out we know it we know it doesn't work and the fed box now so if the Fed suddenly slams on the brakes says we're not going to keep raising rates along the lines I projected earlier, okay, that might give the stock market a boost. And you can't assume that won't happen. You got to watch for that. But I would expect that things would have to get pretty ugly in, in all events before the Fed got that message. 
On the other hand, if, if Powell gets confirmed and feels like it's his last term and here's his chance to be Paul Volcker and he's just going to keep raising rates, he said, my job is to get inflation under control. The rest of you people, you're responsible for fiscal policy and tax policy and spending and, um, you know, shutting down the Keystone Pipeline. Welfare. And all that. That's on you, not me. I, my job is to get rid of inflation. If he does that, and he could, he might, you're looking at a recession, kind of looks like the global financial crisis and hope it doesn't. And there's a difference between extreme recession and financial crisis. They're two different things, but they can happen at the same time as, as did happen in 2008. In this video, Jim Rickards talks about the challenges and potential risks faced by the Federal Reserve in managing the economy. The central theme revolves around the delicate balance that the Fed must strike between preventing a stock market crash and avoiding a severe recession. Jim raises concerns about the Fed's ability to have perfect information, citing flawed models and the possibility of being behind the curve in recognizing economic challenges. The distinction between a recession and a financial crisis is highlighted, with historical examples used to illustrate that these two phenomena can occur independently. Jim Rickards emphasizes the difficulty the Fed might face in choosing between preventing a financial crisis or accepting a recession as a trade-off. The reference to Paul Volcker's actions in the 1980s adds historical context, showcasing a deliberate choice to induce a severe recession for the purpose of combating inflation. However, Jim Rickards notes that the current economic landscape is more intricate, with additional considerations such as systemic risks and the potential for a recession triggering a financial crisis. In conclusion, Jim Rickards underscores the complex decisions the Federal Reserve must make, acknowledging the uncertainties and trade-offs inherent in steering the economy and avoiding undesirable outcomes. Before we get into the video, can you help me to give that like button a little touch? All right, let's get into it. Would the Fed back off if it became apparent that they were going to cause a stock market crash, a disorderly collapse, and a severe recession? The answer is almost certainly yes. But the problem is it might happen uh, anyway. In other words, they, they might have gone too far. And this almost happened in 2018, and that was my point. It was that by, the, by the time they realized their mistake, it might already be too late. So that's one danger, which you, if, they, if they had perfect information, oh, gee, we went too far, gee, we couldn't pull this off, we need to back off. They might back off exactly as you described, but they don't have perfect information. They have flawed models. They tend not to look at history and they could behind the curve. They could crash the car before they knew it was out of control. It's like s slamming on the brakes on ice. You can slam on the brakes, but you're going to go for a long time before the car stops. So that's one problem. This, the second problem is you, you have to separate, as I said, recession, even severe recessions from financial crises. In 1998, we had a financial crisis, but no recession. Uh, 1994, we had a financial crisis, no recession. In 2000 and 2020, we had a severe recession, no financial crisis. That was not a financial crisis. In 2000, 2001, we had a, the, the NASDAQ collapsed 80%, but there was only a very mild recession and that was not a financial crisis. So the Fed might say, and again, might, cause who knows, but they might say, well, of course, we don't want a financial crisis. Now, to your point, Nick, nobody wants that, and they do get out of control. But we're not worried about that. You know, we learned our lesson in 2008. We had Dodd Frank. Uh, and I had this discussion with uh, uh, James Gorman, the CEO of uh, Morgan Stanley. I briefed their board, and they they gave me a lot of pushback. They said, "Well, you don't understand, Jim. We've we've uh, we've you know we have more capital and greater liquidity and less leverage and better credit." And I, I granted, I said, you, you're absolutely right. It's a nice job. You're a stronger bank now than you were then. But in a financial crisis, it doesn't matter. The, the, the problem is systemic. In other words, as an individual bank, you may be better off. But if the whole system's collapsing, you can't necessarily withstand that. So they, they don't want that. But what if they said to themselves, you know what? We don't want a financial crisis, but we don't think that's going to happen. But we'll, but maybe we'll just have to bear a recession. Volcker knew what he was doing. Volcker knew that there was going to be a recession. And the recession of 1981-82 that he caused was, at the time, the worst since the Great Depression. Now, we've surpassed that twice since then, uh, 2008 and uh, 2020, although it's hard, it's hard to know what 2020 was. I mean, down 36% in two months and up 38% in the next two months. I mean, what... 
what is that? But uh, but at least in technical terms, um, we've had two worse recessions, 20, 2008 and 2020 since then. But at the time, and I, I began to live through that, I was around, uh, that was the worst recession. But Volcker knew that would happen. He said, that's the price we have to pay to break the back of inflation. And he did. And by 1986, inflation was like 2% or 1.8%. Now, there was far less worry about financial crises at the time. Uh, because remember, this was before the repeal of Glass-Steagall. You know, commercial banks, no one really cared about investment banks. They could fail. So what? They cared about the commercial banks, and they had a pretty good handle on that. Um, so they weren't worried about financial crisis. But today you would be, uh, be for the reasons we mentioned. So the so there are two possible major blunders here, but again, don't under, underestimate the Fed's ability to do both. One <laughs> one is that they could they could decide they don't want a recession, but not know until too, until it was too late. They just tighten into it, don't know until it's too late, and then the damage is done. The other one is they could sign up for a recession, say, yeah, sorry, but that's the price of getting inflation under control and trigger a financial crisis that nobody wants but could happen anyway. So, you know, it's kind of so and uh, you know, take your pick. Severe recession, but we know it's coming. Recession that causes a financial crisis that we didn't want or just let the inflation rip. What's the good outcome there? What, what's the good one? Yeah. But I think I think those are the three choices. I think you're right. In the face of these complexities, our discussion leaves us with three potential scenarios. The risk of unwittingly tightening into a recession, the prospect of accepting a recession for inflation control, or the challenging choice of allowing inflation to run rampant. The Federal Reserve stands at a crossroads, and the decisions they make in the coming months may well shape the economic landscape for years to come. As we conclude our exploration, it becomes clear that the path ahead is fraught with challenges and decision-making. The balancing act between preventing a stock market crash and avoiding an unintentional recession places the Federal Reserve in a formidable position. The lessons from 2018 serve as a stark reminder that perfect information eludes them, and the consequences of their decisions may only become apparent once it's too late to correct. The historical perspective sheds light on the dual nature of economic downturns, where financial crises and recessions don't always go hand in hand. Drawing parallels to Paul Volcker's bold strategy in the 1980s, we ponder whether the Fed might consider accepting a recession as a necessary sacrifice for taming inflation. A, a vacation, whatever it may be. So that depresses all those other areas. So there is this recursive function. So don't rule out deflation down the road. Not right away, but you know, maybe next year. So cash, but here's the here's the biggest value of cash. It gives you optionality, and people don't understand this. Uh, what if I said to you, "Hey, I'll sell you, I'll sell you a call option, and at the mar at the market call option on every asset class in the world?" And you go, "Gee, that sounds kind of valuable." You know, well, that's what cash is. You, you know, when things are crashing, you're the one who can go shopping, and nobody's better at this than Warren Buffett. He's got his cash level at Berkshire Hathaway is at an all-time high. So there's a place for that. You can have some stocks, but I would look at the energy sector. I mean, this. Um, I actually built and I own the largest non-commercial solar module field in New England. And I run my house off it. It's, it produces about 7.5 um, kilowatt hours. Uh, so I know a little bit about it. And uh, what I know is it doesn't work at night. It doesn't work in snow. It doesn't work in rain. It doesn't work in really cloudy days. By the way, you don't run your house off of solar modules. You run your house off of batteries. Yeah, and mm. the modules charge the battery, so you watch the battery level. That's how you manage it. So it works fine, but if you think you can run cities with that, forget it. So it's just not practical uh, at that scale, even if you thought it was, and it isn't. That's that's very clear. But here comes, uh, you know, wind turbines and uh, solar. And I'm not against it. Like you say, I own one, but uh, but they're not scalable. They're intermittent, you can, and they don't give you the base power, uh, the baseline power you need to run a modern power grid. Meanwhile, here's global demand, okay? So the gap, the gap's getting bigger. It's not getting smaller. Renewables, whatever the pros and cons, are not closing the gap. The gap's getting bigger. There is no substitute for oil and natural gas and uranium. You gotta, you gotta put uranium in the mix. And you know, hydro, if you live in Quebec, that's great. A lot of hydro, but it, not so much in the desert. And I've spoken to, you know, without mentioning names, I would say you can go no higher in terms of who knows, you know, let's just say board members of the five biggest oil companies in the world who, who said, yeah, <laughs> as he said, we talk about that, but we, we can't say it publicly because we'll be, you know, uh, dragged, you know, 
chained and dragged through the to, through the streets. But that's just those are just the facts. So therefore, if you have an oil sector that's been bashed by the climate alarmists, and but you can't do without it, which is true, buy some oil companies. You know when, when they're you know so there's your stock portfolio, private equity, venture, real estate, uh, not commercial but residential, yes, and you know farmland. That's one of the hottest asset categories, and uh, and gold. So that's diversification, and that's the kind of portfolio you want, the kind of season to taste. So the question is, will the Fed go down that path, do what they have to do, do the only thing they can do uh, to subdue inflation at the cost of a very severe recession and something like a stock market crash? Or will they see that coming? They'll be the last to know. We'll, we'll all see it <laughs> before they do, but uh, they'll, they'll be the last to know. It's because they rely on flood, flood models and they're kind of in their own economic forecasting bubble and they're very defective ways of thinking about the economy and they're very much a creature of inertia. There are a whole lot of reasons why the Fed is not nimble. It's kind of quite the opposite. But they'll see it eventually, probably when it's too late. And will they balk at that point and stop rate hikes and maybe even reduce rates? That could save us from the recession, but that will just amplify the inflation. So hmm. rather than say which one's going to happen, I, I prefer to lay out those two paths and then just watch it very carefully. But more to the point, we've seen this movie before. This is a replay, and I, I think it's on, um, you, know, d you know, like you hit the remote control for double or triple speed. It's going to happen faster. But this is a replay of everything that happened from 2013 to 2019 and, and into 2020, which was, so I'll just go through it quickly. So 2013, May, Bernanke says we're going to taper asset purchases. That's that's money printing, quantitative easing, whatever you want to call it. The market, you know, tanks, bonds go down. Everyone's like, oh, it's over. Bernanke blocked. But finally, in November 2013, they said, okay, the taper begins. They were still printing money, but at a slower rate, and that matters. That went on until late 2014. The taper was over. They stopped buying new assets. They said, okay, here come the interest rate hikes, except that they didn't come for another year. It wasn't until December 2015 that then Janet Yellen finally raised rates. And then another year for the second rate increase, so it was December 2016. So it was really, really slow. It took two and a half years, but they got to two rate hikes. But then here comes Jay Powell, and then like Cloudward, boom, 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 25 basis point hikes every meeting. And all the Fed was trying to do was, was to get back to normal. They were trying to get interest rates to maybe two and a quarter, two and a half, get the balance sheet down to, you know, something like 2.5 trillion. They never specified it, but that would have been a reasonable level. So, okay, now interest rates are kind of normal, two and a half, balance sheets down around two and a half trillion. We're back to normal. We finally got through the, the global financial crisis of 2008. We kind of, we undid all that stuff. Well, what happened? Um, from October 1st, 2018 to December 24th, 2018, the stock market dropped 20%. That was the, the, the December 24th, 2018, we call it the, the Christmas Eve massacre. Stock market went down 3% in one day. But the Fed uh, was tightening into the weakness, as they always do. And the last interest rate hike, it was uh, December 16th or 17th, they, within a day or two, but mid-December 2018, they were still hiking and raising rates. And that was the last straw. And then the market just tanked. And then finally, Jay Powell got that message uh, first week of January 2019. He says, OK, we're, that's it. We're going to be patient. Use the word patient. It's one of these code words. You have to get the code book out and see what it means. But patient means we won't raise rates again without giving you advanced warning so you can get out of your carry trades or whatever. Uh, and then he went further, said, huh, looks like we got to cut rates. And they did. And then by early 2020, here comes the pandemic. And then they took rates all the way back to zero. And then they started QE, I don't know, six, seven, call what you want. They took the balance sheet to seven and a half trillion dollars after getting it down to three and a half trillion. So look at that whole sequence from 2013 to early 2020, including the pandemic. What happened? They tapered the asset purchases. They raised rates. They sank the stock market. Then they said, OK, no more rate hikes. Then they cut rates and then they started QE. And by by April 2020, where were we? Zero rates back down to zero. And the balance sheet was a seven and a half trillion after getting down to about uh, three, three and a half trillion. So that was a big um, a circle. It ended up back where they started from. But the point being, they failed 
to normalize. They failed to get rates where they wanted. They failed to get the balance sheet where they wanted. They did sink the stock market. Okay, now two years forward, here we are again. What are we doing? They just raised rates at the at the March meeting. They're going to raise them again in May. And that's the easiest forecast I've ever made. 50 basis points, May 4. Boom. You can you know you can count on it. And they're going to announce. Uh, by the way, I don't have a crystal ball. The Fed told us this. I mean, that's the thing about the Fed. They may be wrong but they're transparently wrong. So they tell you what mistakes they're going to make in advance. So that's the Fed forecasting is actually fairly straightforward because you just have to believe them. Uh, so uh, so they're going to raise rates again in May, probably 50 basis points. They're going to announce a reduction in the balance sheet, whether they actually start it in May, they probably will, 100 billion a month reduction in asset purchases. So that's QT, quantitative tightening. In other words, they're running the same playbook they tried to run or they started to run in 2013, 2014. They failed the last time. Why do they think they're going to be any more successful this time? Why do they think they can get out of this? And the answer is, <coughs> pardon me, the answer is they cannot without a recession. They can normalize rates in the balance sheet and they can stop inflation, but not without causing recession and not without causing a stock market crash. So the big question for the next year is, Will the Fed do that? And they may. Or will they balk again, at which point you might rescue the market, but the inflation is just going to go wild. That's that's the debate. But 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 the thing is about framing it that way, you've got two paths and we'll, we'll get signals along the way. We won't we won't be the last to know the Fed will, but we won't. You'll be able to see this coming. I can tell you exactly what the Fed's going to do. And you can do this at home. So if listeners want to take notes, it's, it's really easy. First of all, what is the problem the Fed's trying to solve? What is their solution? And then what are the exceptions to that so that we can have a complete predictive analytic model? The problem they're trying to solve is the following. We know from a long series of experiences, you know, 30 or more business cycles since the end of World War II, that when the U.S. is in a recession, you have to cut interest rates 3 to 4% to get the U.S. out of a recession. You need 3 to 400 basis points of cuts to get the U.S. It's like a plane heading for the ground. How do you pull it out of a nosedive and get it back up in the sky? The answer is 300 basis points of cuts. How do you cut interest rates 300 basis points when you're only at 75 basis points? The answer is you can't. And forget about negative rates. The evidence is now pretty good that negative rates do not work. In other words, negative rates are not more of the same. When you go from, let's say, a half of 1%, and you go to a quarter, and then you go to zero, and then you keep going to negative 25 you didn't just ease by another 25 basis points. The evidence from Japan and Europe is that you're through the looking glass and you have very strange effects, really unintended consequences. I'll give you a couple examples. So the conventional theory is, well, the more I cut interest rates, the more stimulus I get. That's a joke, but that's what they think. But if I go negative, you're absolutely going to go out and spend the money. Because if you don't spend the money, I'm going to take it away. You sit there long enough, you'll have nothing left in your bank account because I'm going to take, with these negative interest rates, I'm going to take it away. So people will run out and spend and the other thing is that, you know, it's, it's obviously, you know, from the lending point of view, they'll borrow money, you know, because the bank pays you to be a borrower. But here's what happens in the real world. And this is the difference between academics and human beings. When people see negative interest rates, people have goals in mind. They have lifetime goals, right? They want a kid's education, parents' health care, their own health care, retirement. If you start taking their money away with negative rates, guess what they do? They save more. They're like, hey, I got to put my kids through college. You're taking my money. Well, I better save more. And then what kind of signal is the central bank sending with negative interest rates? They're sending a deflationary signal. So people go, well, if, you're, if you think it's going to be deflation, I'm not going to spend money. I'll wait till the price comes down. So you're trying to encourage lending and spending. And what you get is more savings and no spending, deferred spending. You get the exact opposite of what you want. So again, another uh, egghead experiment gone awry. But the point being, so negative rates don't work. So zero bound really is zero. It really is a boundary. And you know, Bernanke has said this in his recent writings, and, and I think he's right about that. So back to the problem, how do you cut interest rates 300 basis points when you're at 75? Well, the answer is you can't, so you have to raise them to 300 basis points. So the problem the Fed is trying to solve is how do they get rates to three and a quarter percent before the next recession? Now, I'm not saying the Fed sees a recession, and that's easy because the Fed never sees a recession. In 102 years, the Fed has never seen a recession, never forecast a recession, but they know their economic history. We are eight years into an expansion. This is, it, it feels punk. I mean, the growth is anemic, but you know, labor force participation is low, productivity is dropping. There are a lot of bad things going on. But in fact, we are in the eighth year, actually coming up on, soon be entering the ninth year 
of an expansion, which began in June 2009. Right. By the way, you have a hard time convincing most Americans that we're not still in a recession. Depressions are different than recessions. You know, the technical definition of a recession is two consecutive quarters of declining GDP with rising unemployment, a couple other bells and whistles, little subjective factors, but that's basically it. So people, when you say depression, they're like, huh, depression sounds worse than a recession. And if recession is two quarters of declining GDP, then a depression must be like 10 quarters of declining GDP because it's got to be worse. But that's not the definition. The definition of a depression, you can have growth in a depression, but it's below trend growth. In other words, if trend is three, three and a half, and you're actually banging out one and a half, two, that gap between, let's say, one and a half and three and a half percent growth, that's depressed growth. It's an output gap. It compounds over time and you never get it back. We are losing trillions of dollars of wealth. We are impoverishing future generations on a relative basis because of our inability to get back to trend growth. So the reason American people feel this and don't listen to the economists and they're right is because we're in a depression. So leaving that aside, the Fed at least understands the business cycle and the fact that the next recession, you know, they say they don't die of old age, but they do die and we're getting closer to the next one. So they are in a desperate race to get rates up to three and a half percent before the next recession hits so they can cut them to get out of the recession. The question is, can you raise rates enough to cure the next recession without causing the recession you're preparing to cure? That's the dilemma. That's the finesse. My answer is no, they're not going to be able to do it, but they think they can. Why are they in this box? Well, because Bernanke should have raised rates in 2010, 2011, in the early stages of the expansion, when the economy would have been much better able to bear it than it is now, Bernanke skipped a whole cycle. He skipped a whole rate increase cycle to pursue these wacky experiments and, you know, QE and zero interest rate policy and all that. I spoke to Bernanke about this and he used the word experiment. He said this was an experiment. He, you know, Bernanke made his academic reputation by studying the Great Depression, you know, in the wake of Friedman and Anna Schwartz and some others. But he, he was a great scholar of the Great Depression and he got his chance to kind of try out his theories. But what he told me was, he said, 30 years from now, some new Ben Bernanke, some young scholar will look back and tell us if we did a good job or not. We actually don't know right now. See, the, the Great Depression was, was really two technical recessions, 29 to 33 and then 1937, 38. But from 33 to 37, we had an expansion. But the whole thing was a depression because we never got out of it. You know, the stock market recovered the 1929 high in 1954. It was a long time to get back to even. But Bernanke's mantra was doing something is better than doing nothing. I completely disagree. It's better to do nothing if you don't know what you're doing. And this is really the monetary equivalent of the Hippocratic Oath. You know, doctors say, you know, first rule of being a doctor is first do no harm. Anyway, bottom line is by pursuing QE and zero interest rate policy, Bernanke failed to raise rates during the early stages of a cyclical expansion, which he should have done. If he had, if he had, the economy would have been just fine and we'd be able to cut them today, but he didn't. So Janet Yellen now has to make up for lost time. So that's the mission. But again, and this is what the market completely does not get. And the Wall Street economists don't get, nobody gets this because they see the Fed raising rates and they've done the correlations and the regressions back to World War II and they go, huh. Every time the Fed raises rates, the economy is getting stronger. So if the Fed's raising rates, the economy must be getting stronger. So bid up stock prices, et cetera. But that's like saying umbrellas cause rain. In other words, they've got the causality backwards. The Fed never leaves the economy, ever. The Fed follows the economy. So a normal business cycle looks like this. So you get a little expansion going and unemployment starts to go down and industrial capacity utilization starts to go up and inflation starts to go up. And the Fed's watching, 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 and then it keeps going. They go, oh, it's getting a little hot. We better raise rates. And they raise rates. But of course, they started too late. The expansion keeps going. Inflation keeps going up. Unemployment keeps going down. Then the economy starts to cool down. Unemployment goes up and then prices go down and capacity utilization drops. And we get into a recession like, huh, we better cut. You know, and then they cut and cut and cut and cut. And then you hit the bottom and then you come out of it again. So think of that as like a nice, pretty sine wave, right? That's a business expansion, business contraction over and over. 30 or so times since the end of World War II, with the Fed always following the economy, never leading the economy. So all the big brands on Wall Street, they've got all this data and they say, well, every time the Fed raises rates, the economy is getting stronger. 
that has absolutely been true for like 30 times since the end of World War II. It is not true today. The reason it's not true today is because Bernanke skipped the cycle and they're playing catch up. For the first time since 1937, the Fed is tightening into weakness. That is a key thing to bear in mind. The Fed is tightening into weakness. They are not leading the economy to strength. They are not responding to strength, even though Wall Street thinks they are. And there's a great danger that they're actually going to cause the recession they're preparing to cure, as I mentioned. The Fed will raise rates 25 basis points four times a year from now until the middle of 2019 until they get them to three and a quarter percent. So like clockwork, every March, June, September, December for 2017, 2018 into 2019, look for a Fed rate hike until they get to three and a quarter percent, at which point they'll be able to say, all right, now we're three and a quarter. If we have a recession tomorrow, we can cut them back down to zero again and get out of it. That'll be mission accomplished. Now, this is why I was sitting there in December, like, yep, they're going to raise them in March. And right now I'll tell your listeners they're going to raise them in June. There's your Fed response function. There's your baseline scenario. What are the exceptions to Fed rate hike? And under what conditions will they not raise rates? Because this, everything I just described to you, they've had in mind since March 2015 when Yellen took patience out of the statement. That was the end of forward guidance. And by the way, if you go back to 2015, you know, I said they're not going to raise rates all year. And they weren't going to do the liftoff that, that people were looking for in March, June, September. And they didn't lift off in September because the Chinese rate exchange devaluation, the stock market fell out of bed August 2015. Finally, they raised them in December 2015. And Wall Street was ready for March. I said, no, in June, no, September, no. It wasn't until December 2016 that they raised them the second time. So obviously, there are conditions under which they don't raise rates, notwithstanding the baseline scenario. So what are those conditions? There are three. Well, four, actually. So if you see job creation below 75,000, that will cause them to pause. By the way, pause is the key word. If you go home through the speeches, you'll see the word pause in Dudley's recent remarks. Pause is... The Fed's jargon for we're not going to raise rates. We got the gym scenario, which I took from the Fed as their scenario, or a technical recession. So, you know, we're going to know Friday what the first quarter GDP is. It's pretty close to negative, but I'm not saying we're in a recession now. We might be. But if you see a recession, they'll pause. See job creation below 75,000, they'll pause. By the way, that's a very low bar. You know, if you see a jobs report, see, this is the other thing that confuses Wall Street. You see a jobs report with 100,000 jobs. So Wall Street goes, oh, that report's really weak. The Fed's going to think twice. No, 75,000 is the number. Yellen told us that. It was in one of her speeches. You just have to be a geek like me and, and read all the speeches. So the third factor would be disinflation. So the Fed has this 2% inflation target. They missed it for six years. They're finally getting close to hitting it. By the way, I think the listeners know they use the uh, PCE core deflator year over year. There's PPI and CPI and core, and a bunch of inflation indices, but we know what they use. PCE, core deflator year over year. That actually has been getting close to 2%. But if you see it turn around, if you see that gap down to like 1.5, 1.4, 1.3, 1 then they will pause. The last condition for the pause is a disorderly decline in stock markets more than 5%. If you see a 6 7 8% decline, so if the S&P went down 100 points, Fed doesn't care. Dow Jones goes down 1,000 points, Fed doesn't care. But beyond that, if you see the S&P start to go down 150 or the Dow start to go down 1,500 points in a disorderly way, it looks a little scary. It looks like there's no bottom. It looks like if you see that, they'll pause. So the Fed is going to raise like clockwork four times a year for the next – Two and a half years, unless you see job creation below 75,000, disinflation, a technical recession. If you don't see one of those things, they're going to raise rates. And so right now, I don't see any of them. I mean, they could all happen, but it looks like, you know, growth is going to be positive. Job creation has been decent, you know, over 100,000. Disinflation is probably coming, but not quite here yet. And they'll want to see a couple months in a row. And the stock market's not crashing. So none of the pause conditions are in place. Therefore, they will raise rates simple. Uh, if you look at yield curves, look at the treasury yield curve, euro dollar futures yield curve, German buns yield curve, they're all inverted. They're all inverted. Now, inversions happen, just meaning the longer term rate is lower than the short term rate. 
We're seeing something globally we've never seen before. And it is the best single indicator of a recession. The last time we saw anything like this was uh, 2007, uh, just ahead of the 2008 financial catastrophe. So the stock market's saying it's all good, Goldilocks, soft landing, Fed's going to get the memo, they're going to cut rates, the pivot, and buy stocks. The bond market is saying no, this is bad and it's going to get worse and it's actually too late for the Fed to do anything about it. See, when these inversions start, sometimes they're a year forward, like, hey, look out, look at the Euro dollar futures yield curve a year from now, man, that thing is inverted. But what happens is, as you get closer to the actual thing you're worried about, the inversion gets nearer and nearer. Now it is literally a month away or, or, or less. So that's like a, you know, a big red siren, a flashing light, whatever you want to call it. Okay, the, um, you know, whatever your baseline is, probably treasuries, you know, to your notes or five year notes or whatever, they will come down a lot, not right away. It's, we were, may still be a month or two away from, on this, but they'll come down a lot and then corporate yields will go up a lot because of the recession, because of deterioration, increased bankruptcies, reduced revenues, you know, et cetera. So those spreads will blow out. And it's important to remember, um, interest rates are a lagging indicator. Everyone's like, well, how could interest rates be um, going up if we're in a recession? The answer is, as you get close to recession, who figures it out first? Well, the Fed figures it out last. They're usually the last to know. Wall Street is second last to know the people who figure it out first are actual business people entrepreneurs restaurant owners dry cleaners taxi drivers um or even medium-sized businesses they see it uh, you know if you're in the trucking business it's it's real time uh you know if inventories are sky high and new orders are being slashed you're not moving anything by truck so there are certain businesses that are concurrent the yield curves i was talking about are very good forward indicators they tell you what's going to happen next a lot of business people are living in the real world in real time. They know what's happening now, and the stock market tends to figure it out later. But as far as banking and credit is concerned, what happens is if you're a business person and you see business heading down, you know, fewer customers, whatever, you go out and borrow all you can. You're like, hey, it's a really bad recession coming. I better, if I got lines of credit, I'm going to use them up now. I don't want my bank changing the term. I said, I'm going to borrow everything I can. And that creates a demand for funds and interest rates go up. And then the recession hits. And the bankers go, huh, what's going on? Credit losses start going up. And then, then they just turn off the spigots and they raise standards, they stop doing loans. And then interest rates will start to come down. Interest rates peak after the recession has already begun. So interest rates may not have peaked yet. I mean, you know, even the treasury market. So that's not unusual. Now here's what the Fed is uh, is missing, or maybe everybody's missing. When you hear these layoff announcements, people are like, well, if they're laying off, why isn't why isn't the unemployment rate going up? Well, the answer is they have to announce the layoffs. There's all kinds of statute, you know, SEC. So if I'm going to fire 10,000 people, I got to tell the world I'm firing 10,000 people. It doesn't mean I fire them that day. I might fire them you know, on a rolling basis over the next 30 days. And it doesn't mean they walk out the door empty handed and head for the unemployment office. I might give them three months severance, six months severance, et cetera. And so when do they actually show up to the unemployment office and say, you know, give me a check? It might not be till this spring. So the layoff announcements are out there, but the unemployment rate hasn't budged because there is a lag three months. But that's why I said interest rates uh, lag the business cycle and they do. Unemployment lags the business cycle. Unemployment is a lagging indicator. When you're an employer, entrepreneur, and you're in any kind of distress, you know, not as many customers walking in the door, you'll do everything you can to avoid laying people off. You'll, you know, be late on the rent. You'll turn down the lights, find a cheaper laundry, whatever it takes. By the time you get around to firing people, you run out of options. Like, oh, I've done everything I can. Now my business is in jeopardy. I have to fire some people. And then combine that with what I just said about severance and, you know, rolling terminations, et cetera. It's a lagging indicator. But we know enough right now to know that number's going up, but that's not inconsistent with the fact that we're already in a recession. It's exactly what you would expect, um, that unemployment's a lagging indicator. So when the Fed's on a mission, they, they actually don't care about the stock market. Here's what they do care about. They care about disorderly markets. And that's the key word. It's not, if stocks are going down, but it's you know, kind of a little, you know, half a percent a day, 1% a day, trending down, 
lower highs, lower lows, trending down. The Fed doesn't care about that. They're not going to bail out the stock market. They do care if it's disorderly. When was it disorderly? Well, March 2020, at the worst part of the pandemic, it dropped like 30% in like two or three weeks. The fall of 2008, I mean, it was like somebody opened a trap door. The Fed does care about that because that kind of disorderly behavior can feed on itself and end up in a 1929 type scenario. So the Fed will get the memo, as I put it, uh, stop raising rates and begin cuts when the markets are disorderly. That may happen. In fact, I expect it will, but, but we're not there yet. So there may be a pivot, but not because of Goldilocks, but because it's not a soft landing, it's a crash landing. So, so the global economy is in bad shape. Uh, it's going into a recession. Now, a lot of people have said that, um, yeah, 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 we're going to have a recession as if it's no big deal, but they're expecting a mild recession. I see a much more severe recession. Now, the other half, what does this mean for financial markets? And there, um, the best way I've been able to explain it, imagine you're in a, an, an Irish pub and you got three Irish storytellers. And I'm part Irish, so I can talk about the Irish, you know, and, and uh, um, but they're telling three different stories and you got to listen to each one. So there's the Fed story, the market story, and then there's something called reality, what's actually happening. Uh, so stock market's telling us Goldilocks, bond market's telling us, you know, here comes, uh, you know, Hurricane Mitch or whatever. And then uh, there's what I call the reality. Uh, and I guess I'm the storyteller here, but um, what I see is, is a kind of a hybrid. The Fed's doing what they're doing, right or wrong. Okay, they're they're doing what they're doing. The market has their own interpretation. I agree with the market, certainly the bond market, that the Fed has probably over tightened, and they may pivot uh, to say that there could be a rate cut. Maybe I wouldn't rule that out, but for a really bad reason. In other words, if the Fed cuts rates, which they may, the pivot may be real. It's not because they engineered a soft landing and Goldilocks and everything. Oh, that's just right. It's because they screwed up as usual as they've been doing since 1913. They over tightened and they found out too late. And then they got to, then they have to slam on the brakes if, or take the foot off the brake, if you will, in terms of rate hikes and then pivot. And we've seen this movie before. This is exactly what happened in 2018. The stock market dropped 20%. I mean, it's like 19.9 or something on the Dow, so maybe not technically a bear market, but yeah, what's the difference? It dropped 20%. The Fed was tightening into that collapse. The Fed tightened on uh, December 16th, 2018, only like eight days before the Christmas Eve massacre. And after most of the 20% collapse had already happened, they tightened one last time. So what it shows you is that when the Fed's on a mission, they they actually don't care about the stock market, this whole, you know, Bernanke put and Greenspan put and all that. That's not how it works. Uh, they don't care that much about the stock market level.